welcome. How's everybody? Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Good morning, dear students. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Good morning, dear teacher. Good morning to you. Wonderful. the teacher part. <laughs> All right. Um, before we start, there's there, there are handouts over there where the uh, where, one is one is for Joel, and you'll need it for Joel, which we'll get in the first lecture. We'll get to Joel, so you'll need that. And the other is just concerning the end of the year. Um, things about a graduation event. We're booked here now for a graduation event. For those who want to participate and can't participate in it, it's going to be July 15th, I think, is a Saturday. Um, and then I'm going to start asking you to help recruit. We don't have anything to give people yet, but by February, uh, I mean, the, the, the greatest number, I think, of our students come from people who've done the program already. And so I'm going to rely on you on that. And then the first thing is just to get out there that, as you know, as I've talked about before, we do a trip after every class graduates. The, the last class, we just did the trip in May because of COVID, but, um, but just some suggested dates. It could be January, February 2024 or 25, depending on how I feel. Um, <laughs> that means that the new class could participate as well. And the destination will be Israel and Jordan, okay? Um, so that's just to kind of shut across the bow to get you to think, get you to consider it. Uh, you know, you need to be a member of a class or the graduate of the class. You can invite, uh, you know, a significant other as long. That's fine too. So, but just wanted to just get that in your, back of your mind as we finish this year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Say a word of prayer, okay? And with the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. good and gracious giver of all gifts. It's, at least it was my formation uh, in general, maybe the way my parents raised me, that, you know, the old line, if you have nothing good to say, then it's better to say nothing at all. And so I was not raised in, in an in a environment where it was thought proper to question you, God, and to be angry with and, and that, that was an unfortunate element, not that it has a big impact in my upbringing, but still an unfortunate element when, when your daughters and sons are afraid to bring things to their, their creator, their parent, uh, their maker. So as we, as we step into hearing a part of the Old Testament that's all about daring to question you, bring our anger and hurt, we ask you first to bless this assembly, give our, make our ears open, but we also ask you to bless people who right now are angry, very angry, angry at you, feel cut off from you. Um, find a, a way, send a message to send someone to rebuild, that they might rebuild a bridge to you for in turning away from you. They have turned away from the author of life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, the, in the original design of this program, which again comes from the Archdiocese of Denver, each, each lesson was meant to be a weekly thing. Again, with a metropolitan area like Denver, people could travel, you know, in half an hour, be kind of almost anywhere. In the Diocese of La Crosse, because we are so territorially spread out, we have been lumping three different lessons. So it's kind of a coincidence. But we're going to get today in, in Habakkuk, in Job, and in Koheleth, also known as Ecclesiastes, we're going to deal with the, a, a minority voice in the Old Testament that is all about questioning God, all about asking questions, about not holding back. And it's, it's I think, a wonderful 
wonderful compliment to the piety and high regard of God in the rest of the Old Testament. Habakkuk may have seen, may seem initially an, an odd choice. Uh, the reason that this prophetic work is saved until now is that it has a connection to the wisdom tradition. Um, Though a section of the Old Testament is grouped together as wisdom, sapiential, that's another word for wisdom, sapiential themes are to be found in other places. Some of the Psalms are wisdom Psalms. Um, Psalm 73 questions and Psalm 37, that's how I remember the, the two seven threes. One way, they're, they're both wisdom Psalms and they both question whether God allows wicked people to prosper. Why does God allow wicked people to prosper? And both of them, in the end, say, ah, he really doesn't. That's just, I, I was wrong when I thought that. Okay? That's the way, that's the, the way of chapter 70, or Proverbs 7, Psalm 73 and 37. The story of Joseph. Remember Joseph going down to Egypt uh, in Genesis? He is a wisdom figure. Remember, he interprets dreams. He's, he's got, he, he knows what's going to lead to wholeness and success for the Egyptian people. So he is a kind of a wisdom figure. Habakkuk's connection to that tradition is what we could call its dialogical nature, dialogue between God and the individual. The individual, a prophet, asks questions. Why do the wicked uh, suffer and, and I'm sorry, why do the not why do the wicked succeed and the just suffer? Why do the powerful bad people devour those more righteous than themselves? That's the underlying question in the book of Habakkuk. It's, so it's question it's questing into the nature of God's justice and God's governance in the world. Only Job is more direct than Habakkuk is. The prophet will twice complain, and God will twice respond. And then there's a series of sayings against tyrants. And then the last chapter is a theophany. A theophany, where God is, announces or proclaims his presence and establishes order that he can do he can do with chaos uh, whatever he wants to do. So it is, you, it, I think it's proper to see the work as an extended conversation between the prophet and God about how we live in an unjust world. The, the, the book gives very little historical data to help us assign the setting of the prophet. The, the only thing that is there is a reference to the rise of Chaldea. Chaldea is an Old Testament biblical name, alternative name for Babylon. And it can, if you remember in the first year, there, there are two Babylons. There's the, in one sense, there's the original Babylon, Hammurabi, back even around Abraham's time. And then there is <coughs> late in the monarchy, the northern kingdom is already gone. The Assyrians, remember, gobbled up the northern kingdom. But the Assyrians give way to the Babylon, the Neo-Babylonians, also called the Chaldean. Remember, A comes before B. Assyria comes before the Neo-Babylonians. And that's about the year 620, 610. And they're the, they're the nation that gobbles up, in the end, the southern kingdom until the Persians come and, and then let, let the, the Judah free again. So the reference to Chaldea would, and Chaldea hassling the, the people of God would probably, if, if, it's a, if that's a real historical memory, would, would tell us that the book comes from the latter part of the 600s before Christ. Okay? But that's, having knowing, having, knowing that doesn't really help us much, doesn't really matter much, but just to emphasize that the wicked, the wicked who prosper over the righteous are the Chaldeans who are kicking the butts of, the Ju of Judah. That's, that's, the, that's why the, the, the argument of the book. Uh, the, 
So the, the, the quest, the, the probe is, it, remember, remember back, think back to last month. I should have started with a little review of last month. But remember, the wisdom tradition is based on the understanding that, that God has imposed in the creation. Remember, wisdom was his helper in making creation so that there are rules that are woven into or, or, or poured into the, the recipe bowl when, or the, 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 the recipe bowl, the, the uh, mixing bowl when creation was being put together. And, you know, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. That sounds like an equation. Two plus two equals four. But what about if two plus two equals zero sometimes? Okay? That's, that's this aspect. So this aspect of the wisdom tradition is kind of like sticking it to the original. To, to, you know, it's like this day's Bible study is in, in, in argument with last month's argument. The last month's emphasis. Last month's estimate, last month's messages were always that, that, that wisdom can be trusted, just do, do what it says, things will lead, you know, you'll lead to success and wholeness. Well, the lessons today say, well, I don't see that all the time. Okay? And I think there, therefore the heading of today, this lesson is God. A well, wisdom challenge, God on trial. That's an excellent summary of what we're going to be doing today. So there's very little here, but let's do a little reading. Okay? So uh, first we have Habakkuk's initial complaint and Yahweh's response. Look at chapter 1, verse 2. Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? I cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see wrongs and look upon trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law, keeping of the law, is slacked. And justice never goes forth. The world is not fair and just. For the wicked surround the righteous. And justice is perverted. Okay, so that's the complaint. It's right out of the chute. There's no, there's no, you know, dear God or, you know, uh, you know, your holiness, please allow me to address the throne. It's just bam. How come? How come if, again, the implication is if you judge the world justly and wisdom is the doorway to that, how come we don't see that? By the way, this was the first reading like two Sundays ago, I think, huh? Then Yahweh responds, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am rousing the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize habitations not their own. Well, that's the problem. But, but what God says is that I am the one who called Chaldeans. You know, you might think they're hurting you, but they're my instrument. They're doing my, my will. Uh, and then the text goes on to talk about the power of Chaldea. Look at verse 9. They all come for violence. Terror of them goes before them. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and of rulers they make sport. They laugh at every fortress, for they heap up earth and take it that they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. So that's the first exchange. The prophet understands that, that, um, that Babylon is the new player, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the answer to his complaint, is that God is doing something here. The, Bab and the Babylonians are going to punish Judah because that's God's desire. I have power... And I can do surprising things, God says. I will not be tied down by what you think I should do. Okay, so, th so that's, this is, again, a little introduction. That means a, a preparation for what we're going to hear in Job. <laughs> because in the end, God says to Job, you don't get me, you don't understand me, I will do what I will do. In a, and there's more to Job than that. But, but in response to the question about why isn't God fair, well, because I'm God. I will do what I want to do. 
And so you already get a little bit of that here. Chapter 1, verse 12, through chapter 2, verse 4, is the second complaint and God's response. Okay? So um, let's look at verse 13. The second half of that verse. Why do you look on faithless men? Why are you silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he is? Yeah, there's a, in one sentence, that's making the, the argument. And then God responds in chapter 2, verse 2. By the way, two Sundays ago, what we heard, and now you probably recognize this, what we heard was the question of the first complaint dialogue and then we get, and then we and we got the, the answer from the second one. Maybe, 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 yeah. if, if it comes back to you, what they, what the lectionary editor did is take the first question of Habakkuk and respond respond with the second answer of Yahweh. So it was, you should have said that's that's not how it is. You should have stood up and said that's not how it is. <laughs> but I guess you did it. Chapter two, verse two. This is very famous in the New Testament. And the Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain upon tablets so he may run who reads it. That is, write it on the wall so big that somebody doing the marathon running by will be able to read it. Okay? So make a big deal about this, he says. For still the vision awaits its time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Here's the big line. Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. Again, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So what we have in that line is a reaffirmation of wisdom, that, that the, the, the one who is not righteous will indeed be punished. And the, the, and the righteous one just needs to be patient, faithful, enduring, okay? Now, that may not be a, that doesn't explain why bad things happen to good people, but it's a response to what I should be about when I see bad things happen to good people. St. Paul, I, maybe some of you recognize that line, St. Paul makes a big deal about that phrase. The righteous shall live by faith. It be, it's, it's, I mean, he, in the beginning of the letter to the Romans, he quotes Habakkuk. It, that's part of his initial argument. With, as Paul lays out his gospel in Romans, it's this verse. So this verse and Romans are tied together. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 5 to 20 are a series of five woes. What's a woe? Well, a woe is the opposite of a blessing. blessing. Uh, we, we, and, we, and we usually think of them as Jesus has chapter 5 of Matthew. He has eight or nine of them. And in Luke, he has, what do we call those? Beatitudes. So a woe is the opposite of a beatitude. A beatitude is a wisdom writing. It says, if you act this way, good things come. Success, blessedness comes to you. Literally, in the Old Testament, the word that we translate as blessed is or blessed are is happy, ashray. Happy is the one who, who studies the law, for example, because it leads to blah, 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 blah. So here we're going to get the reverse of that. We get woatudes, okay? <laughs> so they're addressed not to the happy people, the just people, but what's going to happen? It's it's the guarantee of punishment to the unrighteous, okay? And, and is the implication we don't know is the implication is the author is the prophet is God promising that in time. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, are going to get their comeuppance? Is, 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 it really, is it directed to that? Or is it just directed in general to, um, you know, again, a, a reaffirmation of wisdom as if followed leads to life, and if not followed, it leads to death? Again, we're not going to read any of them, but that's what you have here, OK? 
okay? A vision of five woes, a glimpse, therefore, of a more positive, that God is not asleep at the wheel, that in time there will be a response, and the Chaldeans will no longer be uh, the nemesis. Chapter 3. Here is a theophany, and you remember that word. If you haven't used it, make part of your vocabulary. You use it ten times today. A theophany. Theos is God. Phaneo is to show or reveal. So when God shows himself, that's a theophany. So um, the transfiguration in the gospel is a theophany. When the Israelites get to Mount Sinai and God thunders and lightnings before the Ten Commandments, that's a theophany. Okay? So we have a theophany here, which, which, which again also makes it like Job, because Job concludes with God showing up. You know? A, so Job ends with a theophany. So there is, I mean, initially, I, I'll tell you, when I first, you know, presented this in a class, I didn't really get why the two fit together. Now it's just it's so, it's so clear to me now, so there's hope for you as you get older. Uh, if you don't get it right away, come back seven or eight times, and, and it, will, it will come into place. So, so Habakkuk is, in a sense, a dry run or a, a, a real thin version of what we're going to receive in, in, in Joel. Um, if you pray the Liturgy of the Hours, this is used... Uh, I don't have the what day, what week, and what day it comes, but it, it appears it's 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 the middle section of, of a morning prayer. Uh, it's a beautiful passage. Uh, let's just read a little of it. Uh, verse ten, no, verse three. This is how it appears in the Liturgy of the Hours. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. My text has the word Selah. Do you use yours too? Okay, where did we see Selah before? Psalms. And remember I told you, we don't know what it means. Some people think it means like, you know, silence, like a break. Or maybe it means time for instrumental music. Or, no, we don't really know what Selah means. But the fact that this, this text, this poem has Selah, makes again, this, this chapter is, is like the Psalms. It, it's a, I mean, it reads like a psalm, and it includes, includes that, whatever Selah is about, and includes that here. So God is coming, okay? His glory covers the heavens. Look at verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. When God shows up in the Bible, nature flees. It bows its head. It runs away. Uh, in Revelation, uh, you know, the, 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 the sea is no more. Uh, again, because God is, because God is all-powerful, and nature is just recognizes its place. It's, it's, it's low. It's not powerful. It's, it's the creature. It's not the creator. And so the mountains are scattered. Look at verse 10. The mountains saw thee, saw you, and writhed the raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. So in this third chapter of Habakkuk, after the first two chapters question that God is asleep at the wheel, the last chapter is all about re recognizing again the the intense might and power of God. And creation gets it. Sun and moon and, and, and oceans and, and forests understand. Verse 14. You did pierce with your shafts the head of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. So this verse is promising that it sees a day when God, as a warrior, is going to come in and devour and defeat the one who has been hassling me. Okay? You did trample the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. We'll see this in Job. I've referenced it a few times earlier. 
Remember when we read in the very first year, we read the creation story of Babylon? Remember, it was all about water, Tiamat, and the, the battle among the gods. But it, 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 all, it all began with the coming together of the fresh waters and the sea waters, those coming together. So again, and water, remember Genesis 1 begins with the image of, of, of chaos is the water on the earth everywhere. So when we see in any of the Psalms, or we see here in Habakkuk, and we'll see in Job, when God speaks about trampling down the sea, it means the, the, the sea is the, the, the memory, the, the, the little faint memory of that Babylonian story about the gods uh, who came from the sea, who were reflected in the coming together of the waters. Our God is stronger than that. Our God puts order where there's only chaos. Uh, the next verse, the last half. So now, now so we, we've We've had this strong affirmation of God's power, and now the poet, the prayer, finds his place. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. So his response here is, hey, I, am, I will be patient for the day God chooses to act. Again, that's going to ring a bell at the end of Job, after God buries Job with all his questions. Job says, I put my finger to my mouth. Okay. Though the fig tree, do, and this is the best part, though the fig tree do not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vine, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will, I will joy. That's what it says here. I will joy. I will, Bible says, I will I'll sing joy, make joy. I'll be joyous in the God of my salvation. Can we have the word indulge? Well, that's much better than, than this. <laughs> but, but you see, but what does the author in the end say? That my relationship to God it will not be affected by my environment. You know? It's not just I praise you when I'm, when I'm healthy and when I'm full and when it's sunny out, but I will pray to I will praise you when I'm sick and when the snow falls and when I'm in pain and when, you know that my connection to you God is not disrupted by the context. Again and that too is an echo of what we're going to encounter in Job. Um, just maybe to state Again, the theology of Habakkuk in four points. Number one, that the prophet has a great concern for apparent rampant injustice. Chaldea is kicking our butts. Two, an effort to present God as powerful and just, even in the face of what seems to be his failure to act, his injustice. Three, an assertion that righteousness and faith are inseparable. Four, God remains our hope for salvation in time of trouble, but we must trust even when circumstances suggest otherwise. Number one, concern for rampant injustice. There's injustice in the world. Acknowledge that. Two, an effort to present God as powerful and just, even in the face of number one. Okay? Even in the face that things are running like wisdom says that they should run. Three, an assertion that righteousness and faith are inseparable. That confidence and faith in God, even when things you get the shaft are inseparable and four that God remains our hope for salvation in time of trouble but we must trust even when circumstances would suggest otherwise any questions or reactions it's a short book quite simple but anything I wonder always that whenever God shows up on me 
nature of this story? Yeah. Is that trying to give us a fear, or what is it? A, a proper fear, a proper sense of that we're not God, that we don't know how things work. Nature, see, nature is always honoring God. Trees know how to honor God. Rocks know how to honor God. Birds know how to honor God. We don't. We have to learn. And so the poet uses those images of, you know, the trees and the, and the sun and the moon are quiet and they run because they know about God. They never forget. They have, they never forget who God is. But we have to learn from them. Okay? All right. We're going to just plow right on. Unless you've got, you know, need a little break. Just to say a have a cup, we're done. Okay? Okay? Very good. Here goes. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. With these words, the Bible introduces one of its most memorable characters. Let me just stop and ask. How many of you have tried to read Job? Before this class, tried to, have tried to deal with Job? Raise your hand. How many ever read Job? <laughs> okay, that's almost all That's good. I mean, most... Everybody talks about Job. Very few people have really worked through it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I just hear, I mean, I can remember in seminary, oh my gosh, you know, um, we, we, I was in a seminar, and uh, actually it was, it was undergraduate, I was in a seminar where it was the topic, and gosh, the crap that we learned, we learned. I mean, it, was, it was just, it was like, it was everything about what Job was. I mean, Job has been a big deal uh, in the last 200 years, you know, think of, think of, you know, the Holocaust, you know, what, you know, the, 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 it just led philosophers and thinkers, maybe people not so terribly religious, but philosophers trying to see in it, this is, well, this is the, here's the answer, here is, is religion's answer to, to why bad things happen to good people. And that's not what the book is, but that's what philosophers are looking for. We want the crackerjack answer of why do bad things happen to good people. And so we impose that on the book. That's not exactly what Job's about. But I know lots of people who try to read Job, and just like, they, they don't, it, they come away going. <laughs> we did it in the 6 o'clock Bible group many okay. years ago, and it almost killed us. Killed your mind. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just so long and. Well, all, all of the above. Yeah. You know, and there's parts that are just kind of dry and, yeah. oh, you know, yeah, and, and repetitive. Yeah. And, and Very much so. And in the end, you say, well, what, what do we know? What do we know now that we didn't know before? It's not apparent. But today, we're going to reveal, flip the veil. Okay? Yes. Revelation. We'll come out. One of the comments, like Revelation, Job is one of the few books that the secular world sort of has heard of. Yep, you're right. Yep, yep. It's very big in the secular world. No, not, you know, you know, people who are not religious, they've read it. Because they think it's philosophical. And it's not philosophical. It's all theological. It's all about God. And that's why they make it into something that's not. Because they want, they're wanting a philosophical response to the problem of evil. Which maybe you know that that word is called theodicy. So maybe you've seen that, not in our reading today, but again, theos is God. And this is the root word for um, uh, righteousness, for justice. So is God just? Why do bad things happen to good people? So in the, in the popular imagination of our culture, Job is an icon. He is the emblematic sufferer who endures without complaint. In fact, the phrase, the patience of Job, you've heard that, huh? She's got the patience of Job. It's actually a quote from the letter of James in the New Testament, which convinces me that the author of James had never read Job. <laughs> because how long does Job have patience? Not long. Not one chapter, long. One chapter. One cha well, two, actually, two chapters. <laughs> two chapters. So, but that phrase, the patience of Job, is a conventional religious image from the letter of James. And yes, and Job is a, a, t a tower of patience in chapters 1 through 2. And he remains a tower of faith through the book. But not patience in the sense of what we think of it. In the 20th century, Job has become the patron saint of people religious and not outraged by, by a God who would permit and allow atrocities. Again, like the Holocaust. We've talked before about Jews 
and you, I didn't do the research, I should have. Um, there are some wonderful, by the way, I have my, some books up for you to take if you like. There's like six or seven books about Judaism there that we, I would recommend to anybody who wants to learn more about it. Not, I mean, Judaism, not this question. But, you know, in America, well, in the world, in Israel, about a third, about a third of Judaism, of Jews in Israel are atheists. And, and they will point to you, like, you know, well, where has God been for us, sort of thing, you know? You know, where, you know, and, 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 the, and the, the reaction of, you know, all that, all that the Jews have suffered, often at the hands of religious people, has led many Jews to say, this is our culture, this is our national identity, but it's not anything that we, we don't believe in. religious man or not? Um, I mean, he, he was surely raised with religion. He yeah. was surely raised with religion, yeah. but did you get a sense he, that he, he was religious? He lived it. Yeah. yeah, and that's Jews will do. They'll, they'll live a religious way, but they don't really often believe. Mm -hmm. we, can, we Christians, oh, we believe. We just don't live like we <laughs> <laughs> to really suggest names. It is set in Edom. If you remember your map of Israel, so here's Mediterranean, here is, okay, and Jerusalem's here. Edom yeah. is over here, okay? Edom was the territory that was entrusted to the descendants of uh, Esau, okay? And the hills are red, and that the word Edom comes with the root word for red. And so the book is set in Edom. Uh, the Hebrew, that is the language that is translated for us, is extremely sophisticated. Uh, so there's little reason to think of it as anything but a Jewish creation, or at least a, whoever had the idea, has, there are Jewish people, even though it's set in Edom, it's Jewish people who have told this story and handed it on. Ezekiel chapter 14 numbers Job with Noah and Daniel as three wise men. But there's beyond that, there's little really help of knowing anything. Stylistic similarities with Isaiah <laughs> chapters 40 to 55 and some images and words suggest contemporary to second Isaiah, which would be 600 to 400 BC. But again, as with most wisdom literature, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so, so the dating doesn't really matter, but just there, there, I dealt with it. Structure. The book, for once, has a very clear structure, and it's on this half sheet. And if you didn't pick up, it's over there during the break. So pull this out. There is a prose envelope, okay? That is the beginning and the end. Chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 42, verses 7 through 17, are written in prose. And everything else is in poetry. So the poem is set in a prose envelope. Some people say, well, the, the, you know, the, the, the envelope was written by one person and then the, pro, the poetry by somebody else, that could be, uh, doesn't really matter. I just want you to acknowledge it because there's two different things going on. The prose envelope and then the poetry. Uh, the prose introduction sets up this terrible situation between God and Satan, which we're gonna deal with. Um, and then start, then Job is, pun is penalized, punished, First by having all his property and family taken away, and then having his 
health taken away, and that's what causes him to, to, to crack, okay? He complains to God. And three, his, as you know, his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, come to, air quotes, comfort him. <laughs> now, not comfort, oh, they're there, here's a box of chocolates. But they come, in the wisdom tradition, comfort is, let me tell you how the world works. And if you grasp and accept how the world works, you won't keep fighting against it. And life will be easier for you. It's like your mom would tell you stuff, huh? Don't fight it, don't buck it, just as how it is. So they are, do, but what they are, they are the spokespeople, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, for the wisdom tradition, the, the old wisdom tradition, what we, what we dealt with last month. It's like they were here last month, okay? And so they keep reiterating over and over again the, the, the wisdom works, Joel. God doesn't just do stuff cavalierly. If you're suffering, you or your children have done something wrong, okay? That's, that's an, and, and Joel responds to each one by saying, I'm an innocent man. God is obviously not uh, just. He can do what he wants, and he's choosing to do that with me. Don't get up, you know, stop talking to me. And that goes around three times. So each of the friends delivers a response to Job, and then he responds to them. And then it happens again, and it happens again, which is why the book is so terribly repetitive. There isn't really a, there, there are some movements, I mean, from cycle to cycle, some things change a little bit, but not much. The message is pretty much the same, okay? At the end of it, um, it, it says, um, po look at Poem on Wisdom, chapter 28. In the, in the middle of the book, there is a kind of like halftime show, okay? <laughs> Where Beyonce comes out and sings about wisdom. Okay, because it's a, not really Beyonce, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> no? No. no. <laughs> but the point is, it's an intermission. It's meant to give you a break, to rest your ears and, and connect with wisdom again. And then Job comes back for what's called a peroration. That means a summing up of his argument. That's an old word from rhetoric. Rhetoric is the art of how do you communicate in, you know, in the courtroom or in the, in the Congress. A peroration is a summary of your argument. And so there's a grand, Job is a grand peroration. He says, okay, I've had my peace. Come on, God, have yours. So what you expect after chapter 31, and we'll look at it, the text, you expect God to come on board right there, but he doesn't. Instead, there is this young man named Elihu. Elihu is a blowhard. He's a young man. He says, I'm younger than you, old farts, but I see the world differently, and I, I'm embarrassed that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't speak up for God. What Elihu tends to do isn't he add anything. He just is kind of a, again, it's a kind of like a tension reliever or a postponer, or like, wait, 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 we're not ready yet, before God appears. So we're not even going to read, I don't think you get to read Elihu, any of Elihu, I don't think, in your reading. Because it's, it's recognized by most people as, it, you know, doesn't really, again, doesn't really doesn't really take us anywhere in the narrative. It may dramatically, again, cause us just to kind of catch our breath before God comes on. I took that a little differently. I, I, I thought that he was showing that in either the established or the new generation, there's no answer. Well, and that, that's, that's as good as the explanation as the enemy. I, you know, again, I would have just made it go away, but I'm not able to do that. Uh, but your auth you know, the authors of your the textbook said this is not so important as the other stuff. But it is, it doesn't, it, it's, yeah, young or old, they say the same thing, and it doesn't really answer the question. But I thought he was like a sophomore in confidence. Yeah, sophomore in the worst sense. Yeah. You know, those of you, sophomores are the ninth, uh, tenth graders, soft, sophistry comes from the, the school of philosophy, Greeks, the sophists. You know, they, they, they try to struggle with wisdom and understand things. And, and then and more comes from moron. <laughs> Soph, sophomores are in their second year in high school. They think they know everything, but they're still morons. <laughs> that's where the word comes from, sophomoric. So he is sophomoric. Like that's, that's a good way of saying it. He didn't know that, did you? <laughs> so you learned just this, pearls here. <laughs>
All right. Then Yahweh comes on the scene. And, and Job tries to interrupt, but then God just comes on again. And then there's the prose conclusion, the prose epilogue, all right? Which is, I mean, which kind of put things back like they, where they started, which is kind of like, like, didn't you listen to the last 39 chapters? But in any case, that's how the, the story chooses is, 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 is ending. Many people assume, assume the purpose of the book is to discuss the problem of evil or to reconcile divine goodness and absolute power. That's what theodicy is about. But the seeker after such answers will be disappointed. For the whole piece, the bigger issue has been the character, I'm gonna, this is, I'm gonna argue, the, the point of the book is a person's relationship to God. Who is God and who are we and how do we relate about this question about evil? The drama begins immediately in the prologue. The reader learns something that the, about the storyline that Job and his friends cannot know. So you've got to recognize that. Job and his three friends don't know the prose part. Huh? We get to know all of it. Actually, here's what I'm gonna, I'll lay on, on the table. I think the best way to understand Job is not as a documentary, but as a play, a theater piece. The prologue and the epilogue set the stage. And then what happens in between is a dialogue between all the characters. Job and his friends, the friends of Job, Elihu, uh, again, Beyonce for, for, for intermission, and then God. So, and again, now some people are like, oh my God, you mean, you mean it, it, it didn't really happen? <laughs> I hope by our fourth year, you understand the, the Bible's a library, and there are, there's a lot of history in the Bible. I think this is one text that is best understood as a dramatic piece that's playing out wisdom themes. Because, well, because, as we're going to discuss, if it's a documentary, then God is kind of an old fool because Satan backs him in a corner. Yeah, you know, we'd say, well, come on, God, you can get some better answer than that. So, so you know, I just want to, if that troubles anybody, come see me during the break. But it really, it's, it's a theater piece where it's debating the themes of wisdom, which makes it, it's, it's inspired of God. Oh, my gosh, it's so true. But it's not historical in the sense that this, hap this, that this really happened at a certain time in a certain place. It's about all of us all the time. So again, the reader learns that Satan and God have made a bet. And Job is, is, the, is the, he's the subject, he's the laboratory rat. He, he, he is kind of allowed, he's pushed around so that Satan and God can have their little game. So it makes God look just terrible. I mean, if you just, if you take that, like, oh my gosh, how God operates. Um, the three friends, as I said, are introduced as proponents of the traditional notion of retribution, the law of retribution. And they push it with a determination that we have not seen, even in the book of Proverbs. I mean, the book of Proverbs admitted that sometimes wealthy people were kind of turds, okay? Which doesn't seem to fit the wisdom theme. But, but here, they just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. The friends assert not only that the just prosper and the wicked perish, but they become more and more bold in accusing Job that since he suffers, he must have sinned. He, just acknowledge your sin, Job, and then it'll all be better. If Job would just fess up, God will restore him. This, this has seeped into, and maybe not so much today, but when you were children, you know, the kinds of things people would say when disaster struck a family, you know, when a child was still born, when an infant got cancer, when uh, a young person, uh, a couple on their honeymoon are involved in a plane crash, you know, people say things like, "Well, oh, God must have wanted them, needed them better than more than you," or you know, or, or you know, that that's we don't know, you know, that's our attempt to try to make sense out of what's nonsense. 
You know, if God's controlling the universe, how can things like that happen? And and so we you know we tend to say things like that. Not really, we don't know what to say, so we say things like that. <laughs> like what's my favorite one that I always complain about? Uh, God never gives you more than you can handle. There it is. Yeah, never say that. Never say that. But Job does seem to reinforce that because God and Satan are playing with human beings as pawns. That's the it, so. You know, that be where that kind of comes from. God never gives you what you can handle. That seems to be the motif of mythology, though, too. You know, that oh, absolutely. So maybe there's a little of that. Yep, yep, yep. So uh, the book is not so much an exposition of traditional wisdom teachings and then somebody responding to it, but in the course of the poetic section, many wisdom conventions will be addressed. The idea of creation comes up a lot the importance of memory, that life can be a burden, the personification of wisdom, that's, that's, that's the Beyonce piece, uh, the problem of retribution. All of them come up in various moments during the central section of the book. But Job maintains his innocence throughout and rejects the validity of their arguments. The wicked do flourish, he says. They live in prosperity. They die in peace, he complains. The arguments of the friends, he says, are ashy, ashy, like ash can, ashy maxims. They cannot please God by distorting the truth in God's behalf. That, those are all lines from Job. Okay? There is, as I said earlier, no logical development, or not much, of, in a long debate. Maybe some new facets appear now and again. Let's look at chapter 1 and, and finally do some reading. Everybody on the page first? That's the first thing. There was a man in the land of Uz. Uz is in Edom, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright. He feared God and turned away from evil. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to insist, take, we must take that verse seriously. Some people will like will say, well, but Job is so, he's so impatient, he's so angry, he's so, he's so accusatory during the, the, um, the middle part. He deserves to be punished. Oh, gosh, <laughs> no. I mean, take the text at this point, and it's giving us the truth. Job is an honest man. He, and and, and, and he's got, then all his wealth... All his wealth is described. Remember last month, that's, the, that's happy is the one who, is, who embraces wisdom. She will teach you how to be happy, how to be rich, how to, be, how to get on with life, you know? Healthy, wealthy, and wise is what's promised, you know, early to bed and early to rise. Huh? So the story has to tell us how healthy, wealthy, and wise Job is. Verse 6. So we move from that to heaven. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Again, I bet we've talked about Satan before. He's popped up a few times. He's actually a late arriver into the Old Testament story. Now, we tend to retroject him. So you say, well, isn't he in Genesis 3? The snake? Well, the snake is surely there. And we associate him with Satan. But if you go back, Satan's, the, the word Satan is never mentioned in Genesis 3. It's, it's what we, we, have, we have kind of gone back and retrojected that. Satan, and we, we saw Satan in Zechariah. Um, and maybe, is that it? Is that we've seen so far? Zechariah. Satan, the, 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 just as God's image is developed in the Bible, so is the person of Satan. At the beginning, Satan is like the county DA. His job is to, he's a member of God's court. He works for God. Huh? Um, and, and Satan, that means the adversary. Okay? But he doesn't go and put things in your head. He just tattletales to God. That's, in the beginning, in the beginning of, in the Old Testament, in his earliest appearances, that's what Satan is. He is the tattletale 
who, who says, oh God, look at Peter. He's all dressed up there. He's a deacon, yeah, but you know what really goes on inside. Huh? <laughs> That's, but through the Old Testament, that begins to change. Okay? And by the time we get to the New Testament, Satan is the familiar creature of our childhood. In the New Testament, horns, tail, fork, tempter. You know, little, 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 little figure on my shoulder with my face on it. Okay, Mark, you know, you can do that. Then the angel, no, Mark, don't do that. Okay, that's, this is an attempt to objectify the conscience. In our conscience, wicked thoughts and our, and our moral teaching debate. What, sh what should we do? Well, in a, in a culture, like biblical culture, there are two figures huh, on our shoulder. In cartoon, that's how you reflect that back and forth. So Satan moves from being the DA, again, and that's Job and Zechariah. And over the centuries, by the time we get to the New Testament, he is the evil one. Oops. He is the evil one. He's the evil tempter. So when you, so if you, if you want to read more about it, you look at your Erdman's Dictionary, the one wonderful art, uh, little article about that development. Remember, figures develop in the Bible. It's a library, remember? When we it, it, think again about, you know, Moses says an eye for an eye, and Jesus says, no, not an eye for an eye, but turn your cheek. There's development in moral thinking. Think about Old Testament, no expectation of resurrection. New Testament, yes, resurrection. Development in our end. And there's a development in this figure where he moves from one of God's courtiers to the opposition. So in this place, he is the courtier. He is the DA. He's, he's, he's not a wicked character yet. <coughs> he, he says, verse 6, there was a day, well, okay, I'm sorry, verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord, How does Job fear God for naught? Does, God, does Job fear God for no reason? And then he, 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 he does what you say because you reward him. It's like, if, you know, I was an unpopular child, so my mother gave my classmates, $10 each to be nice to me, okay? They would be nice to me, but, but only because of being paid. Stop paying him to be nice, and he'll show you. And God says, okay. <laughs> now, now, that's where, that's where it, that it just represents God as kind of like, okay, go ahead, afflict him, let's see, which makes us kind of like lab rats, okay? And so, the rest of the chapter, in, in famous poetry, you know, one by one the things are taken away. You know, the servants come. I alone have escaped to tell you. you know, the, the, the flock says, I alone have escaped to tell you. The houses have collapsed on, their, on his kids. I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his robe and shaved his head and fell upon the ground and worshipped. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I uh, return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So this is where the phrase, the patience of Job, comes from. It really applies. Verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Chapter 2 returns us and, and kind of plays the whole thing over again. Back to heaven, Satan and God. God says, see, Job is still, he's still my man. And Satan says, well, it's because... You took his stuff. And isn't this true? I mean, take my money, take my house, just don't make me feel, don't get me, 